Welcome to John Gets Games. This is my variety vlog for June 2018, and as always, I have a bunch of different things I'll be covering in this episode, although in particular, I have one large announcement that I'll be covering in the general update section. Uh, before I get into that, though, I would like to mention that I currently have no questions, so there is not going to be a questions and answer uh, section. If you'd like me to do some in a future vlog, then feel free to send some over to johngetsgames at gmail.com, and I'll add those onto the list. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the general update. And uh, the first thing I always do is briefly mention how the Patreon campaign is doing. And there were nine new people who added into the campaign, which is really nice to see. Although the overall total per month went down by $18, uh, there were quite a few deletions and uh, lowerings of support. And I think that that's kind of noise, realistically. That's not a gigantic amount. And overall, the support is still quite strong. And I'm looking forward to seeing how this one is going to be going into the future, especially considering the uh, big announcement that I'm going to be talking about. And I may as well talk about it now. Uh, that has to do with the types of videos that I'm going to continue putting out in the future. Now, for a little bit of context, I've been doing John Gets Games for a little bit over four years. And the first thing I ever did was a review. It was for a game called Tuluva. And over the past four years, I've published 107 board game reviews, uh, which really has added up over time. Uh, I've, of course, put out a bunch of vlogs as well as full game playthroughs over those years. And after doing quite a bit of soul searching over the last two months, I have made the decision to stop making my reviews. Now, there are a lot of reasons to do this, and I've had a lot of conversations with different people as I really felt this out and tried to figure out if this is the right direction for me to be going. And at the moment, I do think that's the case. And I may as well tell you about a couple of those um, thoughts that really went into this. The first one, which was really the catalyst for this thought experiment that has turned into a uh, course change for the channel, is that I do not enjoy making reviews. Uh, honestly, my worst emotional moments with John Gets Games in general happens when I am staring at the camera trying to do these reviews, trying to do the filming process. It's oftentimes quite anxiety-ridden uh, and just really not fun. I've, I've found that I dread um, planning to film these things, and when I actually turn the camera on, I just have this lump in my stomach. And over time, it's just gotten worse. And after four years or so, I just kind of kept doing it because it's something that I'd always done. And I had a moment where I was like, you know what? Just because I've always done this does not mean I need to continue doing this. And I really started to think about the ramifications of what would happen if I stopped making reviews. And just the thought of not doing them anymore already made, made a lot of my anxiety for the channel uh, fade away to a certain extent. Um, the next thing that I'd like to mention as a big factor has to do with the, the way that reviews really dictate the games that I play. Now, I started making uh, videos for board games because I love board games, and I've been crazy about them for over 10 years at this point. And now, because of the reviews, I've found that almost every time I get together to play with friends, they all first ask, like, hey, John, is there anything that you need to get played for one of your reviews? And more often than not, I say, yeah, I really need to play this one game at the three-player count. I've only played it at four, and I really need to talk about it at the three-player count. I've kind of overplaying it already, but let's play it now so that I have that context to make the review better. And I found that I just, it's made me less excited to play board games. And I have a bunch of games on my shelf that I haven't even touched, or games that are old classics that I love that I've already reviewed, or they're just so old I never even considered reviewing them, that I would like to continue playing. And I, I want to have the ability to pull those off the shelf and play the games that I want to play to have fun. And that's realistically what's happened, is that the reviews have caused it to feel more like work when it's, you know, a Friday night and I'm trying to play board games with my friends. So that is another uh, significant factor. And uh, the third factor that I'll mention, there's a lot more than three, but these are the main ones, has to do with some of the plans that I have for the future. Uh, when it comes to being in the board game industry, I, I guess I've been uh, doing this for four years and I've got a whole bunch of support and a lot of people know who I am, so I sort of am in the industry to a certain extent and I've been doing this professionally now for six months now, so definitely um, it's a big part of my life. But I don't necessarily want to be making YouTube content for my full-time job, for my career for the rest of my life. I started making these videos because I was bored and I have a lot to say about board games and I'm very excited about them. But when I think about um, where I want to be going, I want to be making these videos long into the future. I do really enjoy making them. But I think I want this to continue to be a part-time sort of endeavor, like, you know, a significant portion of my hours going into it, but not like 40 hours a week. Um, there are other things that I'd like to do specifically with board games. And one of those things has to do with 
making board games better. Uh, before I even started making reviews, uh, way back in like 2010, I decided I wanted to be a board game designer and I made a design blog uh, and I worked on like four or five designs, only one of which sort of got finished. And I realized throughout that process that I'm really not a very good board game designer. I don't have the iterative chops to continue making the game over and over and making it uh, a little bit better than making an entire new prototype and then, you know, throwing that prototype away and bringing a whole new one out. But over that process, I met a lot of people who were board game designers, and I realized that I love playtesting other people's games and trying to make those other games better. Essentially, one of my favorite things in board gaming is looking at the whole game and trying to figure out how it should be better. And in a lot of ways, that's what my reviews have been over the last four years. Uh, they're sort of like development notes for a board game that's fully published and cannot be altered in the future. So it's almost like, um, uh, what's the saying, like uh, the, the horse before the carriage or the, the horse has already left the barn or something like that when it comes to a lot of the things I say. So one thing that I would like to try and work myself towards, it's, I don't really have a roadmap for this yet, but is potentially working with publishers as another part of my job to try and do some uh, late stage uh, playtesting of board games and do professional development work for those games so that the notes and the thoughts and all the, the things, that, the, the thoughts that I have for these games can actually go into tweaking these games so that when they actually get published, they don't have the issues and flaws that I see in them. And of course, I'm just one person and a lot of people don't agree with the issues that I see in games. But overall, I think that's a better direction for me to try and work towards. And I actually uh, talked to a couple publishers about this at the UK Games Expo, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, but overall, I'm excited and hopeful to try and work with this in the future. It's not really the thing that I'm going to be uh, focusing on right now, and uh, what I'm actually going to be focusing on instead is trying to make more playthroughs. Uh, <laughs> I probably should have mentioned this at the very beginning of this section, but I am not planning on um, scaling back John Gets Games from where it is currently. Uh, when I'm talking about this potential development work type stuff, that's essentially me wanting to push out my other main job, which currently is uh, event lighting, and I've been doing that for about 10 years now. And I would like to keep John Gets Games at about the amount of time that I spend on it, maybe a little bit more, maybe add uh, a third day to the week, because right now I'm doing it um, two days a week for the entire day. Uh, and then have the other time be spent on this other aspect of board gaming that I really enjoy. Uh, so in that time, I am planning on trying to make a lot more playthroughs. I kind of realized that I enjoy the process of making playthroughs more because I'm playing board games and I love to play board games. And also, I feel like doing these full game playthroughs is a better way, in my opinion, to show how the game works and to show people if they feel like it would be one for them. Uh, they're usually uh, quite long, you know, most of the playthroughs are over an hour long, but I believe that you get the idea of almost every one of these playthroughs or the idea of how the game plays in each one of these within the first 10 minutes or so of, um, of these playthroughs. So to a certain extent, watching a playthrough is going to give you uh, more context for how the game plays and whether or not you'd enjoy it than watching one of my 25 or 30 minute reviews. So at this point, I think I've uh, talked about this one a lot more than I'd planned on, but that's uh, kind of where I'm at going forward. Um, I have uh, a lot of excitement about trying to get more of these games played uh, through the playthrough context. And uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and wrap up this section, uh, or this um, one uh, part, and move on to the next general update. Uh, for this one, it's a little bit more procedural for John Giz Games, and you might have noticed actually at the beginning of this vlog, you said, hey, wait a minute, he said this is the variety vlog for June? Um, there was no variety vlog for uh, May, because in the past, I've always named these vlogs for the previous month. And what I've decided to do now is I'm taking these variety vlogs and I'm splitting them in half, so to speak. You may have also noticed in the beginning of the video when I showed the different uh, options that there were uh, no, um, of the, there's no initial impressions segment. Uh, so what I've decided to do, since that is usually the vast majority of the content in one of these variety vlogs, I'm going to pull out that into a separate initial impressions vlog, and I'm going to be trying to do those at the beginning of each month, and then I'll be doing a variety vlog right in the middle of each month. So essentially, I'm going to try to do one of these vlogs every two weeks instead of every four weeks. I'm just going to kind of split the content out. And um, I'm not really going to touch the initial impressions. That's going to be just purely all of the initial impressions of all the games I played in that previous month. But when it comes to the variety vlog itself, I have decided to tweak things a little bit. I am adding a, um, a schedule part. I'm not really uh, sure what to call it yet. I guess maybe upcoming uh, projects, uh, because I figure people are probably interested in the videos that I'm planning on putting out in the future. And I have a calendar, you know, I have a schedule where I slot in all these different games. 
So I have a very good idea of what I will be filming this week and next week and the week after that. And I figure, why not show that to everybody else in the world? Uh, so I'll be getting to that section uh, pretty soon. And the other new segment that I'm adding to the variety vlog, which I'll be covering in a little bit in this video as well, is a uh, games of interest segment. Uh, I realized that it might be kind of interesting for other people to see what games I have started subscribing to on Board Game Geek. Essentially, what I'm going to do is look to the previous month to my Board Game Geek subscription feed and see all of the new games that I click subscribe to because that's what I do. When I, when I see a new game that I'm at all interested in, I subscribe to it and then I hope to learn more about it. So I will uh, see how that one goes and I'm certainly going to be looking for feedback on whether people find that uh, section interesting or not. Uh, but yeah, with that, I'm done talking about some of this procedural stuff and now we can talk about the UK Games Expo for 2018 that I went to for the first time this year. I believe that I mentioned in the last vlog that Jessica and I were going to be going away for a two-week uh, vacation over in Europe, and right in the middle of those two weeks, we were going to be going to the UK Games Expo. Now, this is one of the larger board game uh, conventions in the world at this point. Uh, they released the total numbers for this year, and I believe it was over 20,000 uh, people who went over to it, and we had a really good time. Uh, a couple of our friends, Matt and Claire, flew out there as well, and we got to spend pretty much the whole weekend hanging out with them, as well as Efka and Elaine from the No Pun Included pod uh, podcast. A YouTube channel, uh, and um, they are both really good friends of mine as well. So we just had a wonderful weekend. It was very productive for me because I was able to give my business card to a bunch of different publishers and start a relationship with many people that and publishers that I have not actually worked with in the past. Uh, it's very likely that you will start to see me covering um, games from some of these more European publishers based off of the relationships that I have hopefully started off on a good foot at this convention. But I also just got to play a bunch of games and demo a bunch of games, and uh, that's part of the reason why. I'm going to have so many games to cover in the initial impressions vlog, which I will be um, putting out this week as well, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, overall, um, the UK Games Expo was a really fun time. I've been meaning to go to it for the last two years, and it finally made sense to go, and we can kind of roll it into a greater vacation where we uh, went to Scotland for like five days. Um, after Expo, I got to meet up with a cousin of mine who lives in England, and then we actually flew down to France and spent a few days there with my uncle. Uh, so it was a really relaxing, uh, great great time where I got to spend a bunch of time with uh, not only family, but great friends, and I believe I was able to make uh, probably a couple new friends out there as well. Uh, the convention itself, uh, it felt a lot like a smaller version of Gen Con. I went to Gen Con last year, and it doesn't uh, have anywhere near as much uh, space area in the overall convention halls, but there were a ton of booths, and the convention itself was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and we didn't really go into the convention on Sunday because after Friday and Saturday, we felt very satisfied. In fact, we spent about seven hours on each of those days just wandering around this convention hall demoing games. So there was a lot of stuff to uh, get to, and the convention is over in Birmingham in England, and the weather was surprisingly nice. Uh, it was much warmer than we anticipated. We definitely packed with way too many uh, thick clothes for that convention, but it was um, a really nice uh, area for a convention because uh, you have this convention center, and then a right next to it, like a three minute walk, is a kind of mall thing with a bunch of different food options. And what ended up happening, happening is we would go over there to eat and we inevitably bumped into other people that we knew and then we would go and try to play games at the end of the, the night in the, uh, the Hilton, I believe it was called. Uh, so yeah, overall I really enjoyed this convention. Uh, I would likely want to go to it every year if I lived in England, but England is a very long way from California. And because of that, I think this is likely one that I won't be attending uh, in 2019 or maybe even 2020. It might be one I try to get to uh, every few years because, again, I do have family out in Europe, so it kind of combos pretty well with seeing them. But uh, either way, I had a really great time at this convention. Oh, the last thing, of course, I didn't, uh, I forgot, almost forgot to mention that I was part of a comedy musical panel show that Efka and Elaine from the No Pun Included YouTube channel uh, put on, and it was an amazing time. It was uh, team-based. It was uh, myself, uh, Tom Vassell, and uh, Rachel from the uh, semi-co-op um, comic, and we were playing against uh, Richard Hamm, as well as uh, John Perkis from the Actual Law YouTube channel, and uh, Heinze, who is um, also part of uh, semi-co-op, and it was all about trying to guess what games um, Elaine's songs were. She uh, wrote these songs and played them on the guitar. They were kind of parodies and they were hilarious and it was an amazing really uh, amazingly fun time and I know that they are planning on putting a video of that up onto YouTube so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that one and I'm hoping I don't uh, look too dumb <laughs> in that one. 
All right, so that I think is enough talk of Expo. And the last thing that I would like to mention is that um, uh, Efka and I put out a new episode of the Last Place podcast about three weeks ago or so. Uh, I've decided I want to mention that in these vlogs because a lot of people don't know that um, I have a podcast. And it's essentially just myself and my really good friend Efka talking about usually three different games and our impressions of them. Uh, in that podcast, we covered um, Memoir 44, the Overlord version. We also talked a bunch about Manhattan Project 2, as well as Feudum. So I would uh, definitely recommend giving that one uh, a listen. I put a link down to the YouTube version of that one in the description down below. And I think with that, we are now done with all of the general updates for this one. All right, let's now move into the first of the new segments for this vlog, and that is going to be my upcoming projects. Now, it is currently week 24 of 2018, and obviously I'm putting out this variety vlog, and I am also planning on putting out an initial impression vlog that's going to cover all the games that I played for the past six weeks. So essentially, or maybe five-ish weeks, for all of May and then June up until about yesterday. Uh, after that, next week, I'm planning on doing a full playthrough for Century Eastern Wonders, and I'll talk about that one in the initial impressions vlog, because I did get to play that, and I picked it up at the UK Games Expo, and that game was picked by one of the uh, sponsor-level patrons on the Patreon campaign. Uh, they get to choose one game a year, and that's the game that was chosen, so I'm going to be uh, doing that one, as well as hopefully doing a full playthrough for Quacksalber von Quinlenberg, which is one of the Kenner Spiel uh, nominees. I'm hoping to get that one done next week as well. Uh, in week 26, I am planning on doing a sponsored full playthrough for Feudum, which is a gigantic game. I am a little bit nervous about this one, and that's kind of why I'm blocking off the whole week to try and get this one done, because it's probably going to be one of the longer ones that I've ever had to film, and it's certainly going to be a challenging one to get as many rules uh, right as possible in that one. And then in week 27, that's going to be the first week in July, and I'll be doing another initial impressions vlog at that point, and it's just going to cover the games that I played in those last two weeks, trying to get myself caught up to this new schedule where I'll be doing these initial impressions vlogs once every month at the beginning of the month. Uh, in that same week, I'm planning on trying to get a full playthrough out for Luxor, which is one of the Spielesjahres novels. Nominees. And then in week 28, I'm currently planning on putting out a sponsored full playthrough for New Bedford, which is published by Greater Than Games, and I have a really good relationship with them, and I've done quite a few sponsored playthroughs for them in the past. So, as always, this is my rough schedule for the next few weeks. Uh, things certainly could change around, but now you have a reasonable idea for what I'm hoping to put out soon. Next up, we have the other new segment for this vlog, and that is Games of Interest. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, the idea here is I'm just planning on very briefly talking about all of the new games that I've subscribed to on BoardGameGeek over the last month. Um, by me clicking the subscribe button within BoardGameGeek, that means I am interested in learning more, so I don't know a lot about most of these games, and I'm honestly curious if you find this segment interesting, so please comment down below about um, what you think about how I'm doing this. There are going to be 14 games that I'm going to try to briefly cover here. And I'm also, I've got my laptop right here. I'm planning on just kind of surfing through the different pages while I'm talking in real time to try and briefly talk about what I'm thinking. So let's go ahead and start things off. The first one, I'm just going in alphabetical order, is a game called Atlantis Island of the Gods. Now, uh, this one currently has 146 people subscribing to it. And uh, the designer, I'm not even going to try to pronounce their name, and the publisher is called Red Imp Games. And I haven't heard of either of them before. And the reason I subscribe to this one uh, is largely due to the uh, quick blurb, which essentially says that um, you are doing, it's a logical card game with uh, four different boards as you're trying to build monuments on Atlantis before, obviously, it sinks into the ocean. The mechanisms it has listed are action movement programming, action point allowance, card drafting, and hand management. So all of those things are uh, stuff that I like. And uh, one of the more intriguing parts is it says it plays in 20 to 60 minutes, so it's supposed to be pretty quick. Um, I have no idea if this game is going to be good, but either way, I've uh, got my eye on it. Uh, the next one is called Barrage. Uh, this one is designed by Tommaso Battista and Simone Luciani, and that is the main reason why I subscribe to this one. Uh, it's being published by Cranio Creations, and I'm actually curious. If I've recognized Tommaso uh, Batista's other games, nope, this is the only game that he has uh, logged into BoardGameGeek right now. So 
Uh, this one right here says, as far as mechanisms are concerned, it's action, movement, uh, programming, root, network building, and worker placement. Uh, so none of those things really get me particularly excited, but I think that uh, Simone Luciani makes some really stellar games, and so I'm looking forward to trying this one out. It looks like the theme is a dystopic 1930s, and it's a resource management strategic, strategic game where you're trying to build dams and raise them to increase the capacity of water to deliver power to tunnels connected to turbines and stuff like that. Either way, I'm looking forward to learning more about this one, mostly due to the designer pedigree. Looks like uh, 163 people are subscribing to that one, so about the same as the last one. Uh, next up, we have Habitats, and uh, this one actually came out in 2016, uh, but I only heard about it um, about, well, I guess in this last month. I watched uh, Rado's run-through of this one, and I was like, man, that game looks fun. Uh, it's got, uh, it's a tile lane game, but it has a really interesting idea where you uh, move a worker along a grid of tiles, and that is going to be how you select the various different tiles that you're going to be putting into your little habitat reserve. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be running out to grab this one, but I'm quite intrigued by it, and I'm definitely looking forward to uh, giving this one a shot. It's not particularly new, um, and the designer is Cornet Van Morsel, so uh, I've never heard of them. Uh, then next up, we've got uh, Keyflow. Uh, this one, obviously, um, well, for many people, it's going to be obvious that it has the word key in the name, which means that um, it's going to be designed by Richard Brees, and it's going to be the next game in the uh, key series. Uh, there's a whole bunch of key games, and I've only played a couple of them, but I loved Keeper. So uh, that was the last key game to come out. So kind of by definition, I'm going to be curious to see what's going to be coming out with this new one. It looks like uh, this one says its mechanisms are card drafting, root network building, set collection, simultaneous action selection, and worker placement. A lot of worker placement games still being made out here. Uh, and this one looks like it's about a river that's uh, passing through with ships laden with resources, um, doing some trade. It's a card-driven game based on many ideas contained within Key Flower. Okay, well, I've never actually played Key Flower, but um, I've heard a lot of good things about that one, and so I'm definitely looking forward to learning more about this one. It also has two other designers listed, and I should mention them. Uh, oh, Sebastian Bleasdale uh, and Ian Vincent. Sebastian Bleasdale is a very familiar name. I think they did Black Fleet? Let me take a quick look here. Yeah, they did Black Fleet. Oh, as well as uh, Keyflower and a bunch of other games that I won't look at right now. So uh, pretty good designer pedigree going on right there. Um, the next game I subscribe to is the longest one on this list. It's a uh, little monster that came for lunch and stayed for tea. Uh, this one's being published by Strawberry Studios, which is kind of like the lighter uh, game uh, counterpart to NSKN uh, games. And this one is designed by Robin Lees and Stephen McKenzie, who are a designing duo who have designed many games. Uh, they did uh, Beyond Baker Street and uh, a couple other ones as well. And um, I met Robin last year at Essen. Ridiculously nice guy. And also, as far as this game is concerned, um, the mechanisms are hand management and variable player powers. And it's listed as a 15 to 20 minute play time. And it looks like a uh, light racing game where you're uh, playing cards with abilities and everybody has unique monster abilities. I don't know much more than that, then the art looks cute, and uh, I'm just looking forward to seeing what more is going on there, because it looks like that could be a uh, pretty cute little filler. Um, next up, we've got another Atlantis game. This one's called Lost Atlantis. Uh, the designers on this one are Johnny Mollis and Taro Mollis. Those names aren't familiar to me. Looks like they have made other games like Templar's Journey, Robot Factory, Hornet, Foreclosed. I haven't actually played any of those before, but the reason this one jumped out at me was is very simple. The description is just one line, and it says, Lost Atlantis is described by the publisher as a 3X game under the sea. Uh, now, 3X um, is a, a playoff of the idea of 4X, uh, which is expand, exploit, exterminate, and experiment. There's a little bit of, um, I sometimes get those wrong, but those are the kind of ideas for um, uh, uh, civilization-style games. And when, Every time I've seen a 3X game, that means there's no extermination. So instead, you're just doing the expanding and exploiting and experimentation, and I enjoy those things. Um, that's really all this has listed. Um, oh, it's by um, AEG, so definitely a well-known uh, publisher. So looking forward to seeing more about this one. It might not actually be anything I'm actually interested to, but anytime I see 3X, I get interested, because I don't really like finding people that much on boards. Uh, next, oh, the artist also is Vincent Dutrait. So a lot of people are going to be interested in that purely off the art. Uh, next up, we have Lowlands. Now, this one is designed by Claudia Partheimer and Rolf Partheimer, and I believe that this is a first design for them. Yeah, it is. But um, this one's being published by Z-Man, and 
from my understanding is that uh, Uwe Rosenberg had a somewhat significant hand in the development of this game, and it really does look like an Uwe Rosenberg game. I know more about this one than most of the rest on this list because I actually got to watch my friends play almost an entire game of this at the UK Games Expo. Uh, so I did not personally play this one, but it looks like it has some really cool ideas. I was pretty excited just watching what they were doing. Uh, the listed mechanics are action point allowance system, tile placement, and worker placement, which really doesn't do it justice because the main idea for this game is you are trying to uh, breed sheep and put little fences out so that to make sure that they're nice and safe and you score points for them. You're going to build buildings, which can give you kind of combo-y, action-y cool abilities. But also, there are these storm surges, and you're trying to build up a dike to stop the ocean from flooding in and doing damage. And the main idea here is that everybody is collectively building the dike, and a big part of this game is how much have you contributed to the dike. If the dike holds, um, it's big enough to stop the water, then the person who contributed the most is going to get points equal to the difference between how much they added to the dike and the person who added the least. And then the second place person will get that gap, and the third place person will get that gap. And the inverse is is that if the dike is not built big enough and the ocean water floods in, then the person who contributed the least is going to take these uh, negative tokens uh, based off of how far they are for the person who contributed the most, and then likewise for the second least and third least. And the person who contributed the most takes no penalties at all, so they're actually somewhat incentivized to build a lot and then let the dam actually break. There's a lot more ideas going on here, and it looked like a lot of fun, and my friends really enjoyed this one, so uh, I'm looking forward to getting my hands on this one. Uh, it looks like... Uh, it's also being uh, published by uh, Foyland Spiel. So, uh, yeah, very excited for this one. Next up, we have Minerals. Uh, now, the main reason this one is on the list is because it looks beautiful. <laughs> this is a uh, tile lane game. The mechanisms are listed as grid movement, modular board, pattern building, set collection, and tile placement. Um, and you just have to look this one up on Board Game Geek. It's got uh, some gorgeous pictures of these really great, colorful tiles. And it looks like it might be a bit... Uh, like, hey, that's my fish, where as you move around, the tiles get removed from a centralized playing board, so it gets harder and harder to get to different stuff, and I think you're trying to do some set collection there. The designer is Magdalena Slilwitska, or something along those lines, um, and it looks like uh, she is also the uh, artist for it, so it's definitely a beautiful looking game, uh, published by Games Factory. I don't know much more than that, but I'm interested in learning more, because mostly just aesthetically, I think it's a uh, very nice looking game. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is called Pass Tally. Now, this one is designed by Masaki Suga, and um, it's published by Analog Lunchbox, which is a Japanese board game publisher. And this one is very hard to come by. And in fact, uh, just yesterday, as of the course of me filming this, uh, Board Game Geek put up on their store like 20 copies. And I'm super excited because I was able to purchase one of those copies because I'm really looking forward to trying this game out. The list of mechanics on this one are root, network building, and tile placement. But um, really, this feels a lot like a Suro or Indigo-style game where you are putting tiles down onto a board and then kind of the path that gets traced is going to do different things for you. Uh, in Suro and Indigo, it didn't matter how long the path was. You just tried to connect different things uh, or just keep moving in Suro, I suppose. But in Past Tally, it's all about trying to have the longest, craziest, spinny-type uh, pattern through the biggest stacks of tiles to get the most points. Uh, it looks like it's pretty brain burning, and a big reason why this one excites me is because there was an iPad game that came out years ago that Jessica and I love to play, and I honestly can't remember the name of it. Um, I'll put it on screen when after I uh, film this. Uh, I don't know if you can actually get it anymore, but this one, which is super fun, and you got points for the longer you actually spun around on this uh, area. So uh, I loved playing that uh, iPad game with Jessica, so I think that's part of the reason why I'm so excited to play this one. And uh, it also it has a very nice aesthetic appeal to it. So, uh, yep, that one is done. And next up, we've got Quantified. Uh, this one is listed at the designer is Jana Ulrich, and the publisher is Quality Beast. Now, I haven't heard of either of them before. It looks like this is the only design that's um, on uh, Board Game Geek for Jana, and the mechanisms are area movement and cooperative play. And honestly, I don't know anything else about this game. The only reason I click subscribe on this one is because uh, my friend Evka played a prototype of this one at UK Games Expo and said that he was pretty impressed by it, and I haven't actually uh, picked his brain to find out why. Uh, it, either way, it, it, that, that's enough for me to click the subscribe button and try to learn more. Um, the description says, it's a cooperative board game set in a world where everyone's behavior is constantly surveilled and analyzed. A player's behavior results in a social credit score determining their position on the social ladder. Players start from different positions on the social ladder as a refugees, unemployed or, or employed, with uh, unequal rights, access to human rights. 
Uh, the goal of the game is to make all rights accessible to all players and to fight the implementation of totalitarian policies. That's a pretty cool theme <laughs> that I just learned reading that for the first time. So either way, I'm looking forward to trying that one out uh, in the future. Um, next up, we've got Ragusa. Uh, this one li is listed as a 2019 published date, so it's really far out in the future. There's only seven people subscribed to this one yet so far. And uh, for this one, the entire reason I clicked the subscribe button on this one is because of the designer. Uh, his name is Fabio Lopiano, and the only other game uh, listed in the Board Game Geek database for him is Kalima, which came out last year, and I was super impressed by. I really enjoyed that one. So uh, based purely on the pedigree of the designer's single really good last game, I, I would like to definitely know more about this one. Uh, it looks like the uh, mechanisms are listed as commodity speculation, trading, and worker placement. Um, I'm not actually crazy about commodity speculation, so uh, I will definitely look into more on this one uh, because of the designer. Uh, it's being published by Brain Crack Games, which I've never heard of before, but it looks like um, the description of this one says it's set in the legendary city of Ragusa, which is now Dubrovnik, <laughs> and the game charges players with the task of building Ragusa in the 15th century, constructing its great towers, boosting trade with the east, and finding their fortunes. Uh, players are going to be building houses between hexes, it looks like, which gives you access to various resources um, and works sort of like worker placement. So uh, either way, uh, there's uh, two photos on Board Game Geek right now, and they look like euro -y goodness to me. So I'm looking forward to uh, trying this one out for sure. Uh, although it'll be a while because that one's listed again as 2019. Uh, just got three more of these left. Uh, the next one is Railroad Revolution, Railroad Evolution, <laughs> colon, in, in between there. Uh, this is the first expansion for Railroad Revolution, which came out from What's Your Game two years ago, I believe. Uh, and uh, it's uh, designed by Marco Canetta and Stefano Nicolini, um, which, uh, Stefania Nicolini, sorry. And I really enjoyed Railroad Revolution for the first, like, two plays. And then two things happened. One, there was something very strange with how some of the numbers worked and I actually instituted a uh, significant house rule to make a certain thing much more expensive, which made the game better. And the other thing was the variability was not super high. Like if, after I played this one about four times, I, I didn't feel the super urge to come back to it because I kind of felt like I kept playing the same game over and over again. And this um, this uh, uh, expansion, uh, which is called Railroad Evolution, I believe is uh, a big modular expansion for Railroad Revolution. So I don't know much more about that, but I really liked the core mechanisms of Railroad Revolution. So I'm looking forward to seeing what this can bring in and uh, maybe I will end up giving this one a try and maybe it'll revitalize the game for me. Uh, that one's listed as 2018 and... The next game is Spring Meadow. Uh, this is also listed as 2018, and this one is des uh, designed by Uwe Rosenberg, and it is game three in Uwe Rosenberg's Tile Placement Trilogy. Uh, the second game was uh, Indian Summer, and the first game was Cottage Garden. Uh, for some reason, they don't include games like uh, Patchwork uh, in that one, but either way, um, I thought Cottage Garden was fine. I thought Indian Summer was incredibly bland, and based off what I've seen in Spring Meadow, I'm actually very excited. I think this one might be the one that I'm most interested in. Um, it's once again doing tile placement with kind of Tetrisy, polyomino uh, type pieces. Uh, it also, once again, uh, just like in Indian Summer, it has holes in the pieces. But it looks like in this game, the holes are going to be much more interesting in how you actually put them down. And it sort of seems like maybe it's a combo, but, uh, a cross between Cottage Garden and uh, Indian Summer because the uh, picking mechanism for this one uh, has a big grid of tiles in the middle of the table which is somewhat similar to Cottage Garden, but the way you actually grab them is different. It's definitely a different game, uh, and I don't know too many of the specifics on this one, but I believe that when you're putting the tiles in, they um, kind of slide in from the top, kind of in a Tetris-y way. Um, don't quote me on that one. <laughs> I've intentionally not done a ton of research for this section because with 14 games to talk about, I would just kind of forget things as they go. But either way, I'm definitely looking forward to trying this one out. It looks like the... The theming of this one is the first delicate flowers herald the end of a harsh winter. The sun shines longer day by day and pushes the snow back. Lush meadows bloom and curious marmots slowly um, awaken from hibernation. Uh, so it's kind of similar, I guess, theme-wise to uh, Indian Summer. And yeah, either way, I'm definitely looking forward to trying this one. 
And the last one that I'm going to talk about is called Underwater Cities. Now, this one is also listed as a 2018 game. It is being published by Delicious Games, which is not familiar to me. But the uh, entire reason why I've clicked subscribe on this one is because it's being designed by Vladimir Suchi, who has designed several other games that I really liked, like Pulsar 2849, as well as Prodigal's Club and Last Will. I think that he has some really great ideas in his designs, and I don't know a ton about this one. Uh, the mechanisms are listed as modular board, root network building, and worker placement. And the, um, the start of the description says that in underwater cities, which takes 30 to 45 minutes per player, uh, oh, per player, okay, this might be a somewhat long game, uh, players represent the most powerful brains in the world, brains nominated due to the overpopulation of Earth to establish the best and most livable underwater areas possible. Uh, the main principle of the game is card placement, uh, where you're going to be making uh, three by five slots. And um, yeah, it just, uh, there's a bunch of photos online of prototypes. It looks like your wee goodness that I would certainly be interested in. So I'm going to keep my eye on this one. I'm curious. I haven't heard of delicious games before. And it looks like this is the only game they have listed. So they must be, uh, they're a small Czech family project um, that's been um, started for this specific game. So That'll be interesting to see how that one goes. And that is going to uh, round out all of the games of interest. Uh, so once again, uh, this is kind of my first try with this new segment. Uh, please let me know if there are parts of this that you liked or parts of this that you thought I shouldn't do or was it too long or too short or whatever. I would love to hear your feedback on this section. Um, it's certainly one that I find um, kind of interesting because it's nice to talk about the stuff that I am looking forward to in the future. All right, let's now move from talking about a bunch of games in the future to a bunch of games in the now, because this is the Shifting Shelf segment where I talk about all of the new games that I acquired um, since the last of the variety vlogs and also all of the games that I had to pull off my shelf in order to make room for it. And there is certainly a lot of action uh, if you look over there for this specific month. Uh, the first game that I got was Caverna Cave vs. Cave, which is the two-player only kind of uh, modification on Caverna. Uh, I have played that one, and I'll discuss that one in the initial impressions vlog. I also picked up the German copy of Die Quacksalber von Quindlinburg, which is one of the games that's nominated for the Kennerspiel des Jahres. Um, I uh, am hoping to do a full playthrough for that one. As I mentioned before, uh, it's a push-your-luck deck building game. Uh, it looks very cool. Uh, I also got a copy of Drop It. Uh, that's a, a review, uh, review copy, I guess. It was sent over, although I did tell... Um, uh, Thames and Cosmos that I was not planning on reviewing it, um, but I am hoping to try that one and give an initial impression on it in the one after that, because I haven't played this one yet, and it involves dropping these little um, kind of uh, uh, polygon shapes into various areas. It's two or four players. It looks light and fun. I've heard really good things about it. Uh, next up, I got a copy of Gearworks, which was sent to me by the uh, publisher. It looks like it's a relatively quick, kind of puzzly, almost Sudoku-esque uh, card placement game. Um, it looks kind of neat, so I'm looking forward to trying that one out. Uh, I also picked up a copy of Lost Cities. Uh, this is a super old game. It's a two-player only uh, card playing game that I never really got around to, and I had some store credit, and I saw it in uh, a local game store, so I decided to pick up a copy of that one, although I haven't played that one yet. Um, I grabbed a German copy of Luxor. Uh, as soon as that one got nominated for the Spiel des Jahres, um, I decided I really wanted to get a copy of that one as soon as possible to try and cover it for the channel. And as I mentioned, I am hoping to do a playthrough for that one in a couple weeks. Uh, that one's designed by Rudiger Dorn. Um, uh, next up, we have Minara. Uh, this one looks like um, a cooperative follow-up to Via Paletti, if you're familiar with that one. Uh, in Minara, you are cooperatively trying to put all these little uh, dowels down onto, the down onto the board, and then you put these funkily shaped cardboard pieces on top, and you're just trying to build this tower and get all of certain things done before the whole thing collapses. Um, I enjoy dexterity games in general, and this one just looks aesthetically very pleasing. Uh, I also picked up a copy of One Deck Dungeon, The Forest of Shadows, which is a standalone expansion to the original One Deck Dungeon. Uh, this game is a one to two player game, and I uh, picked this one up at the same time I grabbed Lost Cities, just kind of on a whim. I had store credit, so uh, I haven't uh, actually played this one with anybody else at this point, but it's apparently a uh, one to two player game, like I said, where you're trying to delve into a dungeon. It's got a lot of uh, dice rolling uh, type things going on. Uh, next up, I got a uh, copy sent to me of Sailing Towards Osiris uh, that came uh, from the publisher. I did a full playthrough of that one actually last year for the Kickstarter, and they were kind enough to send me a final copy of that one. So uh, I enjoyed playing it last year when I did the full playthrough, so I'm looking forward to giving that one a shot with the final uh, components. Um, it's a worker placement game as you kind of move a ship down a river and you build lots of monuments towards the pharaoh. It's got some pretty neat ideas. 
Uh, I also grabbed a copy of The Mind. Uh, this one is kind of all over the place right now in social media. It is also a game that was nominated for the Spiel des Jahres. And I talked about this one a couple months ago uh, in my uh, variety vlog um, after the Gamma Trade Show because I played it there. It's a very strange game, uh, fully cooperatively trying to play cards in order without communicating. It's kind of like telepathy, um, but not really. And it, it's a strange one and it was cheap and I was already doing an Amazon.de order. So I threw it on onto, onto that. Um, I also picked up a copy of War of the Buttons. I bought this one at UK Games Expo. It was uh, 30 pounds and I got this one because it's designed by Andreas Stedding, who is a designer that I really like. Um, he designed Haunted Teutonica, Stoffer Dynasty, as well as Firenze and several others that I haven't actually tried. And um, Jessica and I actually got to play that game and I'll be talking about that one in my initial impressions. And I liked it enough to pick up a copy. Also, it looks like it's gonna be very difficult to acquire that one in the United States. So I figured I was there, I decided to grab it. Uh, the last one that I picked up is Century Eastern Wonders. Oops, <laughs> these were supposed to be in alphabetical order, but that one did not get sorted well. Either way, I picked up Century Eastern Wonders, which is the uh, second game in the Century Trilogy. Uh, the first game was Century Spice Road, and um, this game is very similar in its DNA to Spice Road, but it's definitely a different experience. It's much more, um, there's a lot more icons going on. There's just a bunch of tiles in the middle of the table as you're trying to convert spices into various things and cash them in for various uh, points. I did play this one at the expo, so I'm gonna talk about that one in the initial impressions vlog as well. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I'm hoping to get a uh, playthrough of this one uh, filmed next week. All right, uh, I had to take a bunch of games off the shelf. I tried to do a little bit of uh, cleaning to make room, but also, also remove some stuff that's maybe been sticking around for a while. Uh, the first thing that I got rid of is 51st State, the Master Set. Uh, this is an engine building game uh, that uh, was uh, published a couple years ago by Portal. Um, I quite liked it. I reviewed it favorably, but I just haven't played it in a couple of years and there's lots of other stuff that I'd rather play instead. Uh, I got rid uh, of a copy of Bubbly Pop, which was sent to me by the publisher. Um, it's a two player, very uh, light game that didn't really end up doing much for me. Um, I also gonna be pulling City of Kings off the shelf. I talked about that one last month in my uh, uh, impressions and it really didn't work out well for us, which is a shame because it's a beautiful, um, expansive game with a lot of really cool ideas, but it just didn't work and I just don't see us coming back to it. Um, I also got rid of my copy of Dead Man's Draw, which I've had for years. I backed it on Kickstarter years ago. It's a really sight, uh, really uh, simple, light, uh, uh, push-your-luck game, but it works great on the iPad. And I think I'd just rather play it on the iPad instead of playing it in person. Um, I'm also uh, pulled Destination X off, which I don't know a whole lot about. I picked it up last year at uh, Spiel, not knowing much, and then I read the rules and it was actually pretty disappointed by what I saw. And so I never actually got around to trying that one. Um, I pulled Ex Libris off the shelf. This one I reviewed favorably last year. It's a neat, highly asymmetric worker placement game where you're trying to um, build out a library that has a very celtic -y feel as you're trying to put these cards down in a push your luck style. But I just haven't found myself really coming back to it since. I just, there's so many new games coming in and I need to make room and I am not particularly excited about playing that one anymore. Um, next up, I pulled Pictomania off um, for a couple reasons. Uh, one, it's a frantic um, drawing game, real time, that stressed me out like crazy. It just did not really work for me that much. And I found out that they're putting out a new copy, a new version of Pictomania that is kind of streamlined, it's a smaller box, and it's less overwhelming with the amount of stuff it throws at you in real time. So I'm definitely gonna be interested in looking into maybe picking up a copy of the new one, but I'm really not interested in playing the current copy, uh, the Stronghold version that I've had for a couple of years. Um, I've also um, taken off a copy of Red 7, which is actually a um, uh, print-on-demand version from before you could even buy it uh, on the bookshelf. When I first heard about it, it's a Carl Chuddy game, a really strange game of like rules changing on the fly. I've had it for years and years now and I haven't played it in all that time. It's a small game, but you know, I need to bite the bullet at some point, just say I'm not gonna be playing this one again. It doesn't take up a lot of space, but I may as well remove it. Um, I've also taken Sagrada off. Uh, this one was a um, dice pool drafting, dice placement kind of game that felt kind of Sudoku-y and puzzly as you're trying to put all the dice into your area, but it, it just really didn't connect with us. We played it a couple times and it did not really show us the game that we were hoping it would be. So we haven't really played it since and uh, I have no problem getting rid of that one. Uh, next up is a game called Sigil, which is also a, um, I say also, kind of like Red 7, in that it's a small game taking up a very small amount of uh, shelf space. Um, but after playing it a couple times, it just did not really engage me. If you'd like, you can uh, search back. If you type in Sigil and John Gets Games into Google, you should be able to find my initial impressions of that one when I played it. It didn't really blow me away, and I haven't touched it in years, so that one's uh, being pulled off the shelf. 
Uh, also, uh, Space Race. Um, I played that one last year and talked about my initial impressions on that one as well. It's a very strange engine building game that's very difficult to teach. And I have my, found myself even slightly interested to come back and play it again uh, subsequently. Um, so yeah, I decided to pull that one off. It's also a strange size box. So it was uh, felt kind of good to pull that one off the shelf to make room for more standardized size boxes. Uh, next up, we have a game called Spires, which is a strange trick-taking style game. And I played this one once, and I talked about that one in, in an initial impression sec section as well. Uh, and it just didn't grab me then, and I haven't found myself coming back to it. And so um, removing it for shelf space. Uh, same with Super Hot, the card game. Uh, it's about the same size, actually, as uh, Spires. Uh, it's a one to two player, or I guess technically you could play three players as well. Um, strange deck building game based off of Super Hot, the video game. And I think it had some pretty cool ideas, uh, definitely some weird tweaks on deck building, but um, it was very strange at two players. It really feels like it's best as a one player game and it's probably great as a one player game, but I just don't play solo games. So I pulled that one off. And the last one is Transatlantic. Um, this one was the follow-up to Concordia from the designer Matt Gertz. I picked this one up at Spiel last year and I made a full playthrough of that one. And the last time I played it, actually, I had a pretty good time with it, but I am not excited at all to pull it off the shelf again, so um, I'm kind of hoping to maybe gift this one to one of my friends so that it stays within the friend group and I can have the opportunity to play it again because I would like to play it again, but it's a large box and I don't think I'm excited enough to keep it in the collection just on the off chance that I happen to maybe play it again at some point in the future um, because I had more fun than I expected last time I played. It's a bit funny, but I decided that was good enough for me to pull it off and that is going to wrap up the Shifting Shelf, and this is also going to wrap up this uh, video. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I've definitely uh, tweaked some various things. I would love to hear your feedback on, um, well, any of these new things in this video. Uh, sorry it took uh, so long. I guess sorry is a silly thing. I'm not going to apologize for this, but uh, it's certainly a much larger gap than I'm used to between Variety Vlogs because we went on that vacation where we got to go to the UK Games Expo. It's just been a really great last uh, five weeks. And at this point, I'm just looking forward to kind of hitting the grindstone and trying to get a lot more playthroughs put out than I normally do now that I am kind of redoubling my efforts to focus on uh, making that kind of content for the channel. So yeah, with that, I think I have now come to the end of this vlog and I'll see you in, uh, well, I guess <laughs> if you watch the initial impressions video uh, very soon, but uh, I'll do another one of these in four weeks in the middle of July. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support these videos, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please consider clicking the like button down below as well as the subscribe button. Thanks for watching.